So welcome back everybody, all those of you online and we have about 15 or so people here in the room. And this is our week two introduction to mindfulness meditation class. I'll be teaching, of course, tonight and for the next two weeks. And then Shelley Graff, the other guiding teacher here at the center, uh, they'll teach the last two weeks um, in April for the course. And uh, for the second week, you know, the instructions are pretty much the same. Is it possible? It is possible <laughs> to be alert and relax. It's just not the habit of the mind, right? The habit of our mind honestly, is to be lost in thought. And that's such a chronic habit that we don't even realize it's a habit. And strangely, it can actually feel a little weird to be present, to not be in my thoughts about things, in my story, my narrative, but just to be in that more simple, immediate presence like what can come in is almost like an emotion of self-consciousness. Like I should probably do something because nothing's happening. And of course, being present doesn't mean nothing's happening. It just means, I mean, this isn't quite right, but it's a useful way to language it. It just means that there's a silent witness observer, a silent, relaxed, non-judging presence. And I think I might have mentioned last week, and it's a useful simile. Again, it's not a perfect simile, but it's useful. It's like a mirror. So as if in our heart, in our mind, there was a simple mirror. The job of the mirror was simply to reflect whatever the mind is knowing. It's just reflecting back. This is being known. Because what happens just because of the way we're conditioned, the habits of the mind, is of course, we're aware, or we usually use the word conscience, uh, con conscious, we're conscious of seeing and hearing and moving about and doing what we do in life. But there isn't that reflective knowing, meaning the mind is knowing what's being known. And just check right now that you know the difference, right? Because in this moment, you can be aware that this experience you're having is being known. And that's a relatively unusual thing for your mind to be doing, to notice, oh yeah, hearing Mark is being known here and now, or feeling weird about being, <laughs> being aware is being known right now. It's like this, or Feeling the body sitting is being known. It's like this. So we're not controlling what's being known. That mirror is simply reflecting. And the mirror, like I've been saying, it doesn't judge. A mirror doesn't care what happens in front of it. It's just going to reflect. In a way, it's going to reflect effortlessly whatever's going on in front of it. And our our mind, our heart has the same capacity, but it's an underused mental muscle, which is why we take a six week introduction to mindfulness meditation class, because we're going to strengthen that mental muscle to be reflectively aware that this is being known. This is being known. And here's the important thing to remember. It doesn't make us weird. And initially it will feel awkward, let's say, but it's only because we're not used to being aware of what the mind is knowing. We're used to operating in a way on autopilot. Like we do our day, we interact with people we interact with, but, but there's not that reflective presence. Oh, it's like this now. And it's like, it opens the mind or wisdom, you could say, to the whole world of like how I'm feeling because that reflective awareness then knows, oh, I'm a little irritated and it's like this. Or I'm a little greedy and it's like this. Or I'm, pretty, I'm feeling pretty chilled out and it's like this. 
but mostly we're oblivious because we're lost or caught up in the narrative. So the mind has a narrative of what's happening and there's in a way, there's no space around it. There's no space of presence. Oh, the mind has a narrative and it's like this. And it's so much more useful. Like if I'm sort of in a negative space because things have been difficult for me, but if I've been cultivating over months or longer mindful awareness, then there will be this non-judging presence that will know, hey, Irritations like this, being depressed is like this. And now I'm saying it in words, right? But <clears throat> that reflective knowing doesn't have to have any language to it, but to communicate it in this setting, of course, I'm going to talk about it as if, you know, wisdom is talking to itself or wisdom is talking to the mind. Oh, this is being known. But presence, when you're present in that balanced, non-judging, present moment awareness, it doesn't talk. Sometimes when you're developing the habit to be present, we put it into words because it's a way of strengthening the habit to basically ask the mind to repeat to itself what it's noticing in the present moment. Right? That's a meditative technique Oh, I'm noticing irritation. I'm noticing the mind planning. I'm noticing the mind seeing. Seeing is like this, right? So during the day, and especially when things are charged, you can practice that mental noting or mental labeling technique, but don't get dependent on it. But it's a really useful thing to be able to draw on when you need it, when the mind needs that kind of clarification. Oh yeah, this is what the mind is knowing. How do I know? Because I can even name it. The planning mind is being known. The judging mind is being known. Irritation is being known. Peacefulness is being known. Sleepiness is being known. Pain in the body is being felt. And that's a really good exercise. So when we do the guided sit tonight, for a period of that sit, I'm going to just encourage you in a relaxed way to gently name some of the experiences that the mind is knowing. And it's just like, it's almost like you, the wisdom is taking a little snapshot. Okay, what's the mind knowing? This is what the mind's knowing. And I'll name it, I'll label it. And if you don't, like if it's, a pain in the butt to come up with a label, just say, this is being known. But when you say the word this, you're noticing the this that's being known, whatever it is, a sound is being known, a mental image is being known, a, an emotion is being felt, sensations being known, hearings being known, whatever it is in the present moment, just practice naming it. And you're, of course, we'll miss a lot because there's so many things being known moment by moment. So when we use that mental noting, we don't expect to catch everything, but just periodically, gently, it's like a mental training, right? Ask the wisdom, let's call it, to simply name what the mind is knowing. And you can even begin with the simple question you drop into the mind. What's the mind knowing now? What's the mind doing? Oh, the mind is reacting. Reacting is being known. Feels like this. Okay. What's the mind knowing? Mind is seeing. Seeing is being known. It's just seeing. What's the mind knowing now? Hearing. Hearing is being known. And, uh, You'll notice, you know, a little like deer in headlights, like, what should I know? <laughs> but that's what you're knowing. That's called doubt or confusion. Oh, this is confusion. Or maybe you're noticing like, I'm trying to do the practice right. Okay. Trying to do the practice right is being known. So don't like feel like there's a right or wrong way. 
You're not trying to become anybody. You're simply trying to strengthen that mirror that can reflect, right? It's a kind of wisdom. It'd be under the category of our, the mind's wisdom, right? This wisdom that can recognize what it is that the mind is doing. And you know how we say sometimes that uh, I, had a, I have a lot of space in my mind. You know, it's sort of a way of saying to somebody, I'm not that reactive or I have a lot of equanimity. I can handle it. We might say, I don't know if you have heard this phrase, but I got a lot of, you know, like the phrase spacious. So that, oh, that person, they're really spacious. You know, they're not tight about things. They're really spacious. They got a lot of space in their mind. Well, this is how one gets space in their mind is to recognize that there is this space of wisdom, of awareness, of mindful awareness. And it's like a mirror. All that wise space does is it recognizes what's being known in the present moment. That's what wisdom does. And the reason we call it wisdom is it sets up a lot of learning. And to put it simply, the learning it sets up is what's skillful and what's unskillful. Because that quiet, non-judging, and over time, continuous presence, it can read cause and effect. Like, oh, when I'm a jerk, nobody likes me. <laughs> you know, it sort of like gets it. I mean, theoretically, we know that. But when we're mindfully aware of what being irritated and then mindfully aware of the kind of things I say to my partner when I'm irritated and then mindfully aware of how they treat me because I've been a jerk, it just becomes so clear cause and effect. And it's precisely because the wisdom, that spacious presence isn't judging. It just wants to reflect back or see things as they are. And that's how the mind becomes wiser. You know, it isn't like we discover some ancient secret, you know, that's been hidden away. I mean, in a way, it is like an ancient secret that's been hidden away, how functional it is to be present and how easily human beings get caught up in the push and pull of life and miss this very practical way to become wiser, kinder, more resilient, happy human beings, just being present. And it should be, you know, um, for those of you who are beginning, it's actually appropriate to be a little bit shocked when you do get a little, initially when you get some sense of what it is to be present, one of the common things that arise then in those moments is, I don't think I'm hardly ever present. And it's shocking, like that we have a human life and most of the time we're not there. <laughs> we're just lost in thought. It should be a little shocking when you, when you get um, some moments in your sit or just during your daily life and you, and you get a sequence of moments where you're basically relaxed, alert, mindfully aware for several moments. And it's like, oh, this is possible. This is possible all the time. And, you know, artists and, and uh, some of the best athletes, and they've discovered this because it, this continuity of present moment awareness is really the essence of human competence, whatever it is you want to be competent at. Because it, you know how it is, the thinking mind, it's a, it's a little bit like, uh, you know, something's happening naturally, and then somebody neurotically thinks they have to take ownership of it but it was already happening. It was already working well. And all, all of a sudden there's some smart aleck kid 
who thinks they're doing it all, you know, and kind of owns it. And that's a little bit like the cognitive thinking mind, which is an amazing tool, you know, to be able to abstract and to think things through. And then of course, the other great thing about being able to language and abstract and language our experiences that allows us to communicate with each other. So I'm not putting down the usefulness of thinking, but what happens when it becomes the dominant force in the mind and then the mind wrongly identifies the thinking process with self. I'm the one who thinks. I mean, they've done a lot of experiments in the last few decades, uh, like when, um, you know, they can trigger a, a reaction in your arm, let's say, but the person's wired up. So, but the, what they find is that the person's mind creates the story, oh, I'm going to reach over here and do this. But that creation of the intention and the idea that I did that comes after the arm did it. And this is a little bit like the narrative, the sort of ongoing internal dialogue narration. It's, it's just um, about maintaining a story that makes sense enough because the mind has become an addict, addicted to having a story that makes sense enough. And we feel uneasy when we don't have a story. And one of the things we learn in meditation and mindfulness, both formally when we're sitting, but all day long as we cultivate this value of being present is we realize slowly, it takes time, but we realize I don't actually need to have a story. We can be interacting with someone like a friend or whatever, but we really don't need an opinion about how this interaction is going. We can be playing a sports game or we can be whatever without defining it in any way. And we find actually life is so much lighter and more free when the mind, the thinking mind isn't projecting something like I'm having a bad day or I'm having a good day on our experience. It's just this being known. So we want thinking to be a tool that we use when it's useful to use, but all the other times it shouldn't be the dominant force that kind of becomes the reality we live in as if our thoughts about what's happening is what's happening. Like, and I think I might've done this last uh, Tuesday, but let's just try this before we do our sit, just a little experiment for the mind. Like we can sit here and I'll stop talking in a moment, but we can sit here and feel the body and hear the ambient sounds of the room. And notice you don't need, like you can have a very real, a very human, a very functional experience as a human without verbalizing or telling yourself or defining the moment in any way. So check that out. I mentioned last week that just mentioned a few things about posture and then we'll do our guided meditation. We'll stretch a little and then we'll do the guided meditation for about 30 minutes. And uh, some of you are sitting on the floor and uh, depending on the flexibility in your hips, we generally sit on the front part of the cushion 
that angles are pelvis this direction if you're facing the way I'm facing, which helps the knees to get a little closer. So just think about that if you're using a cushion. And then if your hips are stiffer, generally you have to sit higher, which makes it harder for the knees to hit the ground. And then the reason we want the knees supported is it creates a, a triangle, which is a broader base. You know, if you're just on your two sits bones and the knees and legs aren't making contact, you're using a lot of core strength to keep the body upright. So you could tuck some pillows under your knees, roll a blanket or a towel, but it's nice to have a broad base of support, whatever you can do. And you can have, like some of you have one ankle in front of the other, or you can do that quarter or that half lotus, you know, where you're putting the top of your foot on your thigh or tucking in underneath, you know, something like this. But basically you're trying to create a nice broad base, tilting it forward. We have curves in our spine, head rests on top, nose in line with the navel, ears over the shoulders, won't be perfect. But the idea is we want a posture that supports alertness and relaxation. And we don't wanna favor one over the other. If we just favored a relaxation, we'd all be in lazy boys or in bed. And you know, if we favored alertness, we might do standing meditation, but we really wanna bring a balance. So, and it's different for depending on your age and your injuries and the nature of your body. What's the posture that supports both alertness and relaxation? And if you're finding that when you sit, you're having trouble with too much tranquility, dullness, sleepiness, then emphasize the uprightness in your sitting posture. Like I've got a little cushion in the back of this chair. So my upper back doesn't hit the back of the chair, right? So you could wean yourself up as opposed to sitting like this, especially if you're having sleepiness, then Try to you know, get some support in your lower back, but not so much in the upper back. And just that ability, just that effort to stay upright will keep you awake more. But if you're finding that you're more restless, more uneasy, then think about what you can do to be more comfortable and maybe change the chair. You know, at home, generally it's the kitchen chairs or dining room chairs that are gonna support a more upright posture. But it's really gonna be, like I said, different for different people. People who have a lot of physical pain, you're gonna to wanna to sit more comfortably because you, we have to work with pain, but if right from the start of the sit, we feel overwhelmed by pain, it's not gonna be a productive sit. We're gonna get in a defensive stance with the pain and we won't be mindful, we'll be basically tolerating pain, which is a, a kind of good skill to have, but it doesn't really lead to deeper learning if all we're doing is surviving the 30 minute set, you know, and then we pat ourselves on the back. Okay, I lived, <laughs> but we're not a wiser human being after that, we're usually a stiff human being. So what, what will work? And so after we do the set and take, a, I'll take a few questions, but then I'll, I'll talk about the walking practice, but because for some of you who have a lot of physical pain, walking meditation, or just, or really uh, have a lot of energy, a lot of restless energy, walking meditation might be a really useful, I mean, walking is useful for everyone. It's a, it's an essential complement to sitting practice, doing formal walking meditation practice. I'll talk about that after the set. So why don't you just stand for a moment, those of you at home, those of you here in the room, just stretch any way you need to so you'll be comfortable sitting for about 30 minutes. And even while you're moving and stretching, it's of course totally appropriate to be aware, okay, moving's like this, feeling the body or whatever's predominant.
And then when you feel ready, come back to your sitting posture. Think about how you want to sit. Make sure you get the supports that work for your body, whatever that is. Cultivating, valuing both the relaxation and that uprightness that supports clarity and alertness. <clears throat> can be a nice ritual at the beginning of a sitting period to just take two, three, four long, full, easy breaths. So you're just filling and emptying the lungs a couple times in a relaxed way, taking your time. And just use it as a way of coming more fully into the experience of the sitting body. As if we have all the time in the world to fill the lungs and to empty the lungs a couple more times. So one more time. And whenever you're done with this exhalation, Simply allow the breathing to continue on its own. And we can be grateful that we don't have to manage the breathing process. We can just trust the body like we do most of the day. Just trust the body to breathe, whatever that's like. And we're gonna begin the formal meditation by using hearing as our meditation anchor. And the first thing we can notice is, I don't actually have to make an effort to hear. Hearing is already happening. So notice that. So then in a more specific way, the effort is to remember that hearing is happening. Can we keep hearing in mind in a relaxed way? And remember, we're not trying to hear anything specific, just opening to the whole field of sounds coming and going. What would it be like to be intimate with the experience of hearing in the most ordinary sense? And this is part of the training. We're cultivating this muscle, this mental muscle to keep in mind something that's relatively ordinary, like hearing, hearing is being known. In this setting, it's not that interesting or not that intense of an experience. So it takes a little effort to remember that hearing is being known. Alert and relaxed.
And get to know this receptive quality of the mind. Sense the receptivity. And even appreciate it, that sense of space, the space of the present moment where hearing is being known. And we're gonna bring the same receptive quality to the sensations of the whole body. Almost like we're listening to the sensations of the body in that receptive way. Feeling the totality, the physicality of the whole body sitting just as it is and allowing the different sensations, even the unpleasant sensations, allowing it all to simply be the way it is right now, changing, flowing on, endless sensations being felt, being known, almost like a river of sensations here in the body, And maybe it's okay not to resist and not to need to control or judge, but in a way just to be vulnerable or exposed to the movement of sensation now. And if you need a little bit more support to keep this bodily experience in mind, you could repeat something like this in your mind, breathing in, experiencing the whole body, breathing out, allowing the body to be. Or during the in-breath, sensitive to the whole body. And then during the out-breath, letting the body be. Something like that, where you're using that verbalization in your mind to support the continuity of present moment awareness using the body.
And when you notice that the mind has gotten caught up in thought or some reaction, then just a simple mental note, thinking is being known or worrying is being known, doubt is being known. So just name what it is that the mind is knowing or just use this, this is being known, it's like this now. And be especially interested if there's some underlying feeling that's there, it might even be subtle. Oh, it feels like this in the body, in the heart, it feels like this. Or can this be okay just to feel this? So in a sense, we make peace with the underlying feeling of any distraction. Acknowledge that it's something being known here and now. And then you can come back to the whole body. And it can be really useful to use the rhythm of breathing in to remember to feel the whole body. Oh yeah, experiencing the body, it's like this allowing the body to be with the out breath. And this will help in developing the continuity of present moment awareness. And again, remember to have a friendly relationship with distraction. Don't get upset or frustrated. Just acknowledge what's being known. So let's continue in silence for a while. Be willing to begin again and again. We learn so much 
each time we find a way to begin again with being present and using the body and the breath as a anchor to help the mind begin again.
One of the first skills we want to learn for those of you who are beginning your meditation practice is how to skillfully use a meditation anchor. So we want to be persistent, but not tight. So we're remembering that there is the experience of sitting, the physicality of the body being known. And we can use the rhythm of the breath as a support. So as we're breathing in, we're, we remember, oh, experiencing the whole body. And as we're breathing out, we remember experiencing the whole body. And just for that short duration from the beginning of the in-breath to the end, can we keep the physicality of the sitting body in mind? This is being known. And from the beginning of the out-breath until the end, can we sustain that presence with the sitting body? Not judging, not trying to fix, just that simple knowing. And when we have an anchor like this, then we are much more likely to notice all the little and big distractions. Oh, look at this, the mind is thinking about this now. It feels like this. This is being known. So we simply turn whatever the distraction is into the next thing that's being known, being felt. And these distractions will cease on their own. They come and then they go. And then when we're no longer drawn to whatever the distraction was, then just begin again with the meditation anchor. Breathing in, simply experiencing the whole body sitting, feeling the sensations as they are. Breathing out, simply allowing the sensations to be, keeping the physicality of the body in mind, and developing this continuity of present moment awareness. So for a few more minutes, just doing the best we can.
And I recommend that we save a couple minutes at the end of our sets to open the eyes and just sitting relatively still, aware of all the different sense gates. So we're aware of seeing, we're not really looking at anything, but there is the visual field being known, seeing is being known, hearing being known, bodily sensations being known, and to some lesser degree, smelling, tasting, being known, even though it's probably pretty neutral. And thoughts and emotions also being known. So for just another minute or so, opening to the totality of our experience. We're not trying to come back to the anchor or anything, just aware of what's ever predominant, staying present as best we can. And noticing if you can, maybe there's a subtle pleasure, just being present, being wholly present. And it feels good in some subtle way to be present. And if that's the case, then notice that pleasure in being present. So it really helps developing the practice if we can sense that it actually feels good to be present. And I might have mentioned last week, some people like to do this gesture at the end of a sit. It's just a, can be an expression of gratitude, grateful to have had the time to sit, appreciating the teachings and the practice. But that would be just something you would do because you want to do it. There's no requirement, of course. And then adjust your body. If there's any stiffness, move around a little. Release any tension. And for those of you who think you can't sit for 30 minutes, you just did. So there you go. <laughs> I guess you can. But of course, it's a lot easier when we're together, even in the Zoom space and hybrid situation. Not so easy necessarily when we're alone, right? Sometimes, you know, you're five minutes and it feels like it's been two or three years. When is it going to end? <laughs> a very well-known teacher here in the West, Pema Chodron, she's a Westerner, but uh, has ordained as a Tibetan Buddhist nun, even though she's a Westerner. She's written a number of books. She's a wonderful Dharma teacher, meditation teacher. And she's one of her phrases is, never underestimate the tendency to bolt. <laughs> right? Because... It's like, it's so strange, like here I am being present, but there can be a really strong sense, I don't belong here, I don't want to be here, anything but this, you know, and we run to what? What do we run to? Some distraction. We run to our computers, our phones, a conversation with someone. And of course, there's nothing special about sitting still, in a quiet space where, you know, maybe it's not so cluttered like a room like this. 
this is like kindergarten for people who are interested in mindfulness, right? Where we've created <clears throat> easy, relatively easy condition. It's a lot harder if we went to the Mall of America or whatever, you know, there'd be a lot of stimuli. Wouldn't be so easy to stay present because we'd see something and then we'd end endlessly think about what we just saw and then we'd see something else or hear something. But it's precisely because sitting relatively still in a relaxed way with the eyes closed often, although you can practice with your eyes open, with mostly neutral ordinary experience, then the, the trick to cultivate present moment awareness is to realize I actually have the capacity to be present with what's ordinary and relatively neutral. It's just not the habit of our mind because we're intensity junkies. We can pay attention to intense things. I mean, we pay good money to watch movies that are intense and you know, video games that are intense and romantic novels that are intense and you know, whatever our intensity fix is, spicy food, we, all, we have something, all of us, right? But in terms of developing this skill, this mental muscle we call present moment awareness, generally we train with what's ordinary. So we can be present all day long with the intensity, but it's just easier to get a sense of what we're doing when we have some ordinary experience. So we're into our second week. By now, everyone should have some place in your bedroom, in your apartment, in your home, your go-to place. If, you're, if you can, just use it for your meditation. Like if you got some corner of some room that you can set aside with a cushion, with a chair, whatever you like. Because then that place sort of all day long, whenever you're there, it's going to remind you, oh yeah, I have this interest in developing this capacity to be present. And that place reminds me of it. And I have sort of this commitment to get there every day, at least to get there and to sit, even if it's just for a few minutes. I mean, ideally you'd be putting in at least 15 to 20 minutes right? Because it takes some time just to settle in and then to stay put. Use a timer. You can download like Insight Meditation Timers, a free app, or just use your regular timer on your phone and put it far enough away so you're not going to check the time. Trust, you know, when you set the timer for the amount of time you think you have, then come hell or high water, you stay for that time. And if you're set, like you're being idealistic, oh, okay, two hours. Well, don't put two hours down. What can you realistically know you're going to stay put for? Be honest. Okay, I know I can stay put for 10 minutes. You sure? Yeah, okay, I think so. May not be easy. May not be as easy as I thought. But I'll set it for 10. I'll put it out of reach so it will catch my attention if I'm doing this to get my phone, right? It's like, oh, that's right. I really committed to being here for 10 minutes. And we'll go back. And we'll feel a little humiliated, you know, but that's okay. That's just humiliation being known. We're right back in the practice. Sitting is being known. Breathing in, experiencing the whole body. It's like this. That's our anchor. It's like a tether, because then we know we're present, because the sensations of the body happen when? In the present moment. And when we have some continuity, some continuity of present moment awareness with the body, then we're going to start to notice all the other impulses to plan, to fantasize, to judge, to compare, endless impulses for the mind to do this and that. But that's called good practice. Noticing how wild, how desperate, the thinking mind is, means you're waking up to the way it is. Nobody said it was pretty. I don't know where, you know, sometimes people read articles about meditation and it sounds like it's a day spa, you know, where you got a really skilled body worker and nice 
aromatherapy and nice music and you know whatever. No, we're cultivating a balanced sensitivity to the craziness, wildness of our mind. And what else do we notice? Living the way we've lived for as many years as you've been living, your body has been the innocent victim of all the intensity and tension and reactivity in your mind. Every time the mind gets tight, the body gets charged with tension, right? It's like when you're like the example of watching an intense movie, notice what happens in your body. It gets tight. So that's happening all day long. So when we sit, even though the intention is to be relaxed and upright and just feeling the body, we feel the residual tension of having lived like we've been living, which is basically laying one layer of tension down on the body after another. So after so many years, energetically, the body is a ball of knots and tension and holding, chronic holding, right? So no wonder Pema Chodron says, never underestimate the desire to bolt. Because as we settle and have more of that present moment awareness, we notice how bound up the body is with tension, some of the time at least. But running isn't going to make it go away or help. Running is just adding the next layer of tension down to the innocent victim of the body. What we do is we notice, oh, breathing in, experiencing the body, oh, Tension. Tension in the body is being known. It feels like this. T- tension may be really kind of gross, like just the ordinary tension of the knee bending in a way it doesn't like to bend. Or it might be sort of s- more subtle, wormy, uh, sort of vibratory sensation. So it could be very subtle, it could be really gross, but whatever it is, we know it's here and now and being known. And the practice is to be open in that relaxed way and alert, curious. Can we be alert and relaxed? Can we allow it to be? And even if we can't allow it to be, if we start to react, okay, reactivity is being known. I'm noticing my mind is in conflict with the tension I'm feeling in my body. Okay, that reactivity feels like this. Can that be okay? No, that's not okay either. I hate this. Okay, hating's going on. Now it's like this. Hating is like this. Hating is being known. That's what's being known. Can that be okay? Do I have a choice? <laughs> what else can I do? And then you, you notice your mind looking for something to be aware of, something to get lost in. Oh, wanting to be distracted is being known. That's what's going on. The mind wants to be distracted. It's desperate to find something to think about, something to fantasize, something to get lost in. Okay, what's that feel like? It feels like this. And we often emphasize like energetically how it feels in the body because it's just easier to be aware of something more dense like the body than the mind is much more slippery and ephemeral. So when we say like, well, what's the, what's it feel like? We're kind of going more to that visceral sense, heart sense, because sometimes we feel it, you know, emotion is sort of a, a blending of mind and body. It's partly mental emotion, but also partly visceral, right? So asking that question can really be grounding. Well, what's the feeling here? What's the underlying feeling here? What else is here, but I'm not noticing yet? So these are some skillful questions. Now I'll save a little time at the end to just mention about walking practice, but I wanted to see, I mentioned last week, and this will be true for all the weeks, we learn so much from people reporting in from the sit from tonight or any of the sits you had this last week, what you learned, what was hard, what felt good, what questions do you have about the instructions or the handouts, Please don't be shy. Yeah, but 
you, you probably, hopefully, noticed I didn't say that the breath should be deeper and longer. The Buddha didn't say that the breath should be deeper and longer. Our practice is to simply notice the way it is. Not judging, relaxed and alert, breathing in, experiencing the body, which means experiencing the breath in the body, because the breath is part of the bodily experience, right? And if you don't like the short or the erraticness of the breath or the tightness of the breath, then notice the not liking. So you're noticing the breath is the way it is, and then you notice the mind doesn't like it or thinks it should be def- different. Oh, that's judging. Judging is being known or not liking is being known. Same thing with like pain in the body. It's not about getting rid of the pain. It's nice when the pain goes away for sure. I mean, but we want to notice the not liking of the physical pain. We want to notice like when we move the body to get rid of pain, oh, look at that. That's moving is being known, not liking is being known. We're, we're just that mirror that is reflecting back, okay? Shallow breathing is like this. And if it's unpleasant, okay, unpleasantness is like this. And of course, over time, as the mind body settles into the continuity of present moment awareness, there is a lot of unwinding of tension, physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, which is great. But that happens not because there's a somebody trying to get relaxed or somebody trying to breathe right. It happens naturally. Whatever got bound up naturally unwinds. It doesn't need you or me to get in there and to unwind the tension. It unwinds when it's seen and felt as it is without judgment. But I totally get that it's not pleasant to notice the breath being tight or shallow or whatever you are noticing in your breathing or anywhere in your body that feels like it's holding tension, it's got baggage. But that's why patience is, the Buddha calls patience, the highest austerity. It's like a really good skill to have. Oh, it's like this now, it's like this. And of course, outside of your awareness practice, it's totally fine to become a great yogi, you know, do your yoga practice and the breathing practices. There's so many other mm-hmm. complementary practices, mm-hmm. body work, breath work. But with awareness practice, we're cultivating the continuity of present moment awareness. That's not the same as fixing stuff, including the breath. But, you know, like we did right at the beginning of the sit, totally fine at the beginning of the sit, just to do some deep, relaxed, full breathing. And if I'm having a hard day, or if I've got a lot of anxiety when I go to bed at night, I'll do some of that deep breathing. It's a great relaxation Mm -hmm. technique. So Mm -hmm. this cultivating of present moment awareness is a higher level spiritual skill. And we can't really do it when our life is a mess, we're stressed out, we don't have enough food to eat. So it's good to take care of that business however we can so that we're in a relatively good place when we sit down to meditate and do the awareness practice. Yes, asking about the use of a mantra. And uh, there are many ways to gather one's attention in the present moment. Like when you think about human religious history and the rituals Mm -hmm. and the chanting and the drumming Mm -hmm. and the color of the ritual and the sound and the smell, there's so many means that humans have used to gather the attention of the present Mm -hmm. moment. And mantra is one of them, prayer is one of them. And like even in our particular way tonight, breathing in, experiencing the whole body. I mean, it's not your typical mantra, but that those words support the attention being 
here and now. So I, with this style of practice, which is you know all about present moment awareness, we're not trying to concentrate the mind, focus on one thing. We're really trying to open to the way it is. So if we use words, we want them to be pointing to the way it is, either the totality of the way that it is in the present moment or some aspect of the present moment. That's this style of meditation. So it's different than a lot of the mantra practices for that reason. But for those of you who have done mantra practice in the past, Mm -hmm. or as a Christian, for example, if you've done like I did growing up Catholic, we did as a family, we'd do the rosary. Good concentration practice. And it's health, It's good for our mind to be able to hold that one thing, you know, to do that one thing. It's, it's really helpful. Realizing that we have this capacity to shift the attitude of the mind. When we bring to mind the capacity to be loving, right, it, then how we're relating to the present moment shifts. So there, these sort of attitude adjustments are really powerful and essential in practice. So right now for the first four weeks, we're just emphasizing the awareness piece. But even then, remember relaxed and alert. Relaxation is the beginning of that quality of love. Like that invitation to be relaxed. Honey, you can relax. Honey, it's okay to soften. That's love. And then the alertness is really shifting the attitude towards interest, curiosity. That's the wisdom piece. So for the practice to really build up some momentum, we need to activate our natural capacity or inherent capacity for love and wisdom. That basically, when we say love and wisdom, we're just talking about the wholesome qualities of the mind, as opposed to, you know, the opposite of love would be hate, irritation. The opposite of wisdom is delusion and disconnection and unawareness, right? Obviously, that's not the way to happiness, hate and unawareness. <laughs> you know, is that the life we want? Probably not. And here at the center, three Friday evenings of the month, first Friday, third Friday, fourth Friday, we do that style of practice. It's drop in 7 to 8.30, the first, third, and fourth Fridays of the month. We do these loving kindness practices. And it's a, an important part of awareness practice. Because like I said, we can't really be aware when we're not in that loving place. You can't do mindfulness from an irritated aggressive, angry heart. You can notice anger, but you notice it with love. You can't see anger with anger. I hate this anger. We're not really (laughs) seeing it. You're just lost in it. And on week four, we'll go in more depth, but I, I will say something about this because even once we get a real sense of what we're doing, this continuity, of this relaxed and alert present moment awareness. We have five things, you know, and you could probably divide it different ways, but you'd still cover the same territory. Five common avenues that are real hindrances for the continuity of present moment awareness. Too much energy, that too too much elation even, just the buzz of life, too much caffeine, right? Dull, heavy, the wanting mind, the not wanting mind, and doubt. And this is a good list. Like when you're finding it impossible to be present, first of all, don't get up. Wait till your timer goes off. You committed to being there for 20 minutes or 10 minutes or 30 minutes, whatever it is. This is interesting. It's like this. So I'm finding it really hard to be in the present moment. Okay, what is it that's here and now? And you can remember this list of five. It's not that hard. And you'll see this list in the um, handout for week four to remember it. So 
And they come in pairs, like wanting and not wanting. So is, is there a wanting going on in the mind? The mind wants something or wants to get rid of something? Or is there too little energy, dullness, sleepiness going on? Or too much energy? Pep, pep fest, is that what you call it? <laughs> or is the mind spinning with doubt? You know, just wanting to think, like, am I doing it right? Should I do it this way? But not really turning toward the present moment. I'll turn to the present moment when I figure it all out. But first time, you know, when you just spin, 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 thinking about Buddhism, thinking about meditation, thinking about how I should sit. Maybe I should sit in the other room. Maybe it'd be better if the cat was on my lap. No, 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 I better not. Should I set, reset my timer? You know, it's just like endless. That's doubt. Oh, okay, doubt. And maybe it's a combination of doubt and restlessness, right? But just to name the hindrance is really stabilizing, isn't it? You're right back in the practice. It may not be pleasant and it may not feel stable, but you're acknowledging what is here and now in the present moment. And that's what builds the momentum. So remember, sometimes our sits are very productive, meaning there's a lot of learning, but it felt like a wild ride. So don't interpret the wild ride as a bad sit. What makes a good sit a good sit is, did the mind learn something about the present moment? Was the mind able to come back many times, even though it got distracted a lot? If the answer is yes, it's okay, good. I cultivated some present moment awareness there. I'm building some momentum. And it starts to play out during your daily life. You'll just naturally, if you're putting a little time into the formal sit, you'll naturally just notice during the day moments of being present. Uh oh, this is being known. It's like that space of present moment awareness is there. Oh, sitting or hearing. Because, and, and it's always a little shocking, like, I'm mostly oblivious, but not in this moment. In this moment, there's awareness, and it's cool. And I'm happy, I'm grateful. Because we want, like I mentioned in the guided sit tonight, we want to notice how right, how good it feels. It's subtle, but it's real. That good, uh, right feeling about being present. And in the same way, we want to notice when we're really lost and distracted, we want to notice how agitating and uneasy it is when we're not present. When we're settled and clear and spacious, it just feels right. Like this is the way to be a human being. But we, it's a subtle kind of pleasure, so we need to attune to it because we're mostly, you know, like I mentioned, we're addicted to intensity. And that kind of dulls our sensitivity to what's good but subtle. So we have to, and that will guide our practice when we can detect the rightness of it. It will really guide. So I want to mention before we end about walking meditation. And there's a nice handout written by Gil Fransdahl, a wonderful teacher from the West Coast. He has a lot of good stuff online, by the way. But it's just a nice, I think, three or four page introduction to walking meditation. And so for your homework, if you would, this week, find one time for at least 15 minutes. It might be a hallway that's relatively uncluttered. It might, you maybe have a bigger room where you can get 15 steps before you have to turn around. And again, I know it sounds so boring to walk from here to there, to stop, to mindfully turn around, to walk from there to here, to stop. But it's not any more boring than watching your breath come in and watching your breath go out, or to be aware of hearing when all you're hearing is the blower and subtle movements and the cat purring over there, you know. We're using ordinary experience. And when your mind rejects this, say, honey, or whatever you like, what's so impossible, what's so unpleasant about being with something ordinary, like walking from A to B? And just feeling the physicality of, you know, the lifting and placing. 
And you can even mentally, if you need that help, you can even mentally note it. Lifting, placing, <laughs> lifting, placing. And just to be with what is so simple. And again, like we do with the breath, can I be present from the beginning of the in-breath to the end? It's the same with walking. Just from walking from A to B, that takes about 15 seconds. Can I sustain present moment awareness for that duration? And then how about from the standing, the turning, can I stay present? And then from walking from B to A, can I be present? And that's how we build it. We don't say, I'm going to be present for 15 minutes because it's not going to happen. Generally, start out at a, you know, if you, depending on the length of space you have, at a more normal pace. But as you get into it, you might notice that you want to walk a little slower because you'll feel more, excuse me, in just the physicality. Now, this is a little different than just walking along the river or walking around the lake or walking your dog or something, which is a great place to practice the ongoing mindful presence. But I'm talking about something that is more extremely ordinary and neutral. So maybe if you can't handle it for 15 minutes, do it for seven minutes. And again, look for the pleasantness that's there when we have present moment awareness. Learn to like it, cultivate the taste for it. If you make yourself do it too long, you're going to end up not liking it and you won't do it. Same with your sitting. If you're going to be macho about it, say, I'm going to sit for 35 minutes or whatever. And then you might just freak out after 15 and never come back. And, now, and then you'll be embarrassed coming back next Tuesday. You'll talk yourself out of it. It'll be 10 years before you find another Buddhist awareness class to come to, right? So build on success. That really helps. Learn to like being present. So it's a little after nine. We'll end here. Thanks for coming, everyone. Thanks. Great to have you here. Hope to see you next Tuesday night, either online or in person. And good luck with your practice. Don't forget the handouts. And I, in all the emails, I include the link to the handouts so you can check them out. And I'll, bring the, I'll send out whenever they process the recording in case you want to use the guided meditation later in the week. And you have the link for the first week guided meditation that you can use too.